Welcome to my new series, Learning Docker. In this series, I plan to cover as much as I can around Docker, but for today, we're gonna to start with the basics and how it compares to virtual machines. So what actually is Docker? Docker is a platform for container management that runs in closed environments on that existing host. You first thought that me, well, that sounds like a hypervisor in virtual machines. Well, you would be half right. The platform and the containers act like a hypervisor and virtual machines, but the architecture is completely different. On top of this, containers can be launched with pre-configured environments. So let's have a little comparison of the two architectures. On the left, we have the virtual machines, and on the right, we have our Docker platform. So in both environments, or in both cases, we're gonna need some underlying hardware. So this is gonna be the host hardware for both setups. Next, we're gonna need a host kernel. Now, I know some people might throw out there that some hypervisors are built into kernels, but regardless, you still need a kernel. Then this is where the divide starts to appear. You have a hypervisor on the left-hand side for the virtual machines, and on the Docker side, you essentially have Docker or the Docker platform. Then we ha start seeing some key differences in how the two environments get set up. So within the hypervisor, we have virtual hosts and or virtual machines, sorry. And in these virtual machines, they have their own contained kernels, or we're gonna dub them in this case, a client kernel. And on the Docker platform, we don't have any child kernels, but I'll go into that a little bit more in the next slide. Then on top of this, let's just say for this tutorial sake that we're setting up Linux, uh, a Linux virtual machine um, and a Docker virtual machine, or a, sorry, a Docker, con a Linux container, I'll get the terminology right one of these days, um, in this whole scenario, so everything's Linux. So on the left hand side, we have our systems, I want to be fair, across the board, we have our systems, and these are essentially just distributions. So this could be a, this could be Linux Mint or Linux Ubuntu or just Debian or something like that. So those are our systems. Then on top of these systems, we're gonna have our applications. These can be anything, it doesn't matter what it is. It's, a, it's either a virtual machine or it's a container, they don't care. So let's kind of address this whole missing question mark, or should I say missing kernel. Why no container kernel? Well, Doc utilizes the kernel of the host instead of having, entirely, having an entirely separate kernel. This allows Docker to use less resources, but still maintain a completely contained environment. So by this, I simply mean, instead of having an underlying client kernel like you saw with the virtual machines on the previous slide, the kernel it uses is actually the host kernel. And this is kind of where the beauty of Docker lies. So is no container kernel a good thing? For the most part it is, but I won't ignore the elephant in the room. If you're using the host kernel, then you are bound to the operating system. If you use Linux, then you wouldn't be able to have Windows containers on like a hypervisor. The important question you need to ask yourself is, do you need cross-platform containers? Now, I'm just gonna tackle this slide a little bit more um, in regards to its approach. In theory, you should use um, the same host as you do have containers in Docker. You don't have to though. And by that, I mean you can have cross-kernel Docker. So technically you can run a cross-platform container, but there's some overhead to consider. If you wanna run a Linux container on a Windows kernel, for example, it is possible, and I'll show you later because that's what I primarily do as part of these tutorials, um, but you require, well, you require the use of a hypervisor to provide a virtual kernel to support your containers like VirtualBox or Hyper-V. But either way, the, the, whole, the whole sort of theory behind this is that you require both Docker and um, and a hypervisor or a virtual machine manager to do this cross kernel docker. So it's not an elegant solution, but it would allow you to use cross platform container for development purposes. Now I'm just gonna hide my head a second so you can see this full diagram. Um, you start with the bottom, obviously the host hardware, then the host kernel, always been the same. Now theoretically the docker uh, platform and the hypervisor would probably sit at um, sit side by side rather than um, one above the other. Ignore the hierarchy for this, isn't explicit. Um, you then have your obviously your hypervisor with the 
the hypervisor clients or the client kernels, should I say. Then on top of that, you have your Docker systems and Docker applications. So it's a bit of a hodgepodge mess in theory, and it's it's not ideal for um, sort of a production environment, but it's quite good for a development environment. If you've got a Windows um, desktop and you want to mimic a Linux operating system, you obviously pass the Linux kernel over to the hypervisor, which will then spin up a virtual machine utilizing that kernel and then drive your docker containers off that kernel so let's create some docker containers now we understand the basics of docker we can get into launching some linux containers before we get going you may need a few things depending on your platform now i've just left a couple of links to the docker um, homepage and the virtualbox homepage you'll only need virtualbox if you don't have support for a hypervisor um, hypervisors, uh, or should I say more Hyper-V, is more common in i7s um, or more recent i7s where they actually have Hyper-V built in. Now you can turn it on or off using the motherboard, so if you do have an i7, say I think it's 5th or 6th gen onwards, uh, it could be even be earlier, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, uh, simply go into your BIOS and enable it and then you won't need VirtualBox. If you don't have, if you don't have a hypervisor, um, or Hyper-V in your or part of your architecture of your operating system or operating system your physical PC Then you will need to obviously VirtualBox regardless of both scenarios You will also need docker so go to docker.com download the developer edition of it uh, Just install it if I'm not gonna do a tutorial on how to press next a load of times um, with Linux you simply you can get the aptitude for it. Uh, I assume Linux developers do know how to use Google, so if you're unsure, just Google for aptitude docker, but it should be the case of apt-get install docker. And for Macs, you just simply have um, an application that you download and run. So, now we've covered all that, let's jump into some docker. Okay, so I'm going to be uploading this as well as all as well as tutorial two and three as part of my first initial setup. Let me just clear that because I was having a, a few problems in the first recording of this when trying to spin up a container. So I think I've addressed all those problems. Now we can just get into things. Now that we have installed our Hyper-V or sorry, we set up a Hyper-V or installed VirtualBox and got Vir and got Docker installed, we need to validate the installation worked okay. And we can do that by simply just kicking up our first container. And to do this, um, Docker provides a very simple test to do um, test your installation by simply typing Docker, run, hello-world, and you should see an output similar to mine here. So, let me just scroll up. Hello from Docker. This message shows that your installation appears to be working correctly. All good. There's some other guff there, but we can go ahead and ignore it. So what we did actually there was we started a Docker container to just see if the actual output displayed what we needed to. Now let's run something a little bit more useful. Now we have this, uh, this containerization platform as well as a Linux kernel running off a of Hyper-V. Let's start um, start interacting with Linux. Now, it's a very this is a very common thing that you'll do when you're first setting up uh, Docker, whether you follow these tutorials or not. Um, and that is simply just to get a Ubuntu or a Linux shell, or in this case, Bash. Now, to do this, we're going to run an application in foreground mode. What foreground mode is is essentially um, not detaching or or basically the the I forgot completely what I was going to say not detaching the container from the STD IO of the console that you're actually trying to run it from and what I mean by that is in this case um, we're just simply going to be running docker um, so we type docker run use I and T as the flags and I've left a few comments on why we use an I and T I is to basically Keep the STD in open even if the container is not attached, but also and the T is to allocate a pseudo terminal. So then we just state that we want to use the Ubuntu container, and which should basically go and get us the latest version of the Ubuntu container, and we just simply want to run bash. So once we've done that, 
you'll probably see a few more things than I did there. I just went and pre-downloaded all of the Docker images by simply going over to Docker, uh, sorry, hub.docker, and basically just type in Docker pull and then the container name or the, con the image name that you wanted to download. Now, in this case, um, it was Ubuntu, so I just did that. Uh, Ah, sorry, I'm trying to type it from within the Linux kernel. Um, let's just verify that the Linux kernel is working as expected. So I can do pwd, which gives me the current path I'm in. I can ask who am I. Um, obviously I'm root. And I should be able to see something etc. And ls works too, so all seems to be good. So if I terminate this, um, or quit this session, it should terminate the container. So. I can just do docker ps, which was basically docker processes to show me that there is no docker containers running. Now just to go back a few steps when I mentioned about doing docker pull. So if I wanted to pull the container down, um, or the image down, I can just simply go docker pull Ubuntu, and it should get me the latest version of the Ubuntu image. But I've already got it, so there's nothing for it to do. Now we've tried something in the foreground, let's try running something in the background. Now I'm actually going to run a Nginx container and I'm also going to take it another step further. I'm also going to do some port mapping. So to do this, what we need to do is run a Docker container. So type docker, dot run, uh, docker space run and use dash d. Dash d is detach mode, so it's going to be running in the background, so it's not relying on input or output from the console at this point. We're also then going to do some port mapping, so we're going to be mapping port in from the client, uh, from our side first, uh, 8080 to, so if you use the colon as the separator, port 80 on the docker container. So on the left hand side it's the port you want to map to on your local machine and on the port on the right hand side is the docker containers port you're mapping. And then simply state that we want to use the engine nginx image. So if I type that you'll notice that it's just giving me a long uh, jumble string. This is actually a reference to your docker image or your docker container. So if I state docker PS now like I did a moment ago, I should have a docker container. So as you can see here, it's mapping on the loopback address 8080 to the port 80 on the local Nginx machine. Now I can verify this by simply going to localhost port 8080. And we basically get welcome to Nginx. Now this is up and running, so we can validate this by terminating the, um, the container. And hopefully that page should not work anymore. So now we have the Docker container up. How the hell do I turn it off? So we can just simply state Docker, stop. And in this case, we need to pass it a container ID. So this is actually just a short hand of the long container ID that we're given above. So if you notice from this container ID, the first, what is that, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 12 characters is actually the first 12 characters of this long container ID. So if I do docker stop, my Docker container should be stocked. I can check that by just doing Docker process. There is no Docker containers running. Now if I go back to the browser, refresh this page, the site cannot be reached. So our Docker container is now off. If we want to do a little bit of cleanup from this point, we can actually go ahead and uh, clean up any images. So you could go to um, go and check the images that are available by typing Docker images. Now you can see that we've used Hello World. This Docker for N Senator Docker is actually, I believe, related to the Hello World. Um, you have the Nginx Docker and the Ubuntu Docker. We can delete any of these Docker containers and. I'm going to just going to show you with the example hello world by simply typing docker rmi so that's remove image and then just in this case hello world now you'll get an error some often like this unable to remove repository reference um it is it basically it's being referenced by something else and i think in this case it's being referenced by I have I can't remember what the hell that is off the top of my head, um, but either way, you can just simply get rid of it by Docker RMI dash uh, sorry, hello dash world dash dash force. You can't see me typing that, but that is exactly what I'm typing. 
and then if I do Docker images, hey presto, it's gone. Now I'm going to end it there for today. Um, that's just covering the basics of getting up a Docker container. We've we spanned one up in the foreground, the background, and we have pulled a couple of images and checked some processes. In the next tutorial, which I have already planned out, uh, I believe I cover um, the Docker files or creating a Docker container from a Docker file and building our own images. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned, hit the subscribe button, hit the like if you found this video useful. If you have any feedback, leave it in the comment box down below. All links should be in the in the comment box in the description box down below, as well as the PowerPoint presentation, the GitHub repository, and so forth. But all the source code should be available to you should you require it. Either way, I will catch you next time.